Hello and welcome to the How to Get an Analytics Job podcast. Our goal here is to help you land your next career opportunity. We do this by discussing the analytics industry at large, how to build analytics skills, how to connect with others within this industry, and also how to build a personal brand. We specifically focus on how you can develop an analytics portfolio. If you're getting a lot of value out of the podcast, the best thing that you can do to get back to us is leave a like, a comment in the comment section down below, or even share this on social media. Also, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell if you want notifications. Every once in a while, we'll post the odd Tuesday or Thursday video. And if you've rung the bell, you're not going to miss a single video from us. Two more things. We've also launched an official Discord server. So this is going to facilitate our community and our conversations. So check the link in the description down below. And we've also launched the Silvertone Analytics Learning Academy. Here you can get step-by-step -step instructions on how to build your analytics skills and also build your portfolio. All right, so now I've got a personal challenge for you. Leave a like on this video, and if we get five videos in a row that have over 100 likes, then we're going to do a special bonus Q&A video where I'm going to answer your questions directly. With all that being said, let's jump into the podcast episode. Welcome back, everyone. So today we're going to be covering chapter two of the Coursera Google Analytics certification program. And Al, I feel like I'm still butchering that because it's it's what it's, it's the Google data analyst, not data analytics. It depends where you go, because I mean, it's like it's under the grow with Google series of courses. Um, yeah, and it's the in other places you'll see it classified as the Google professional development uh courses so i think it's got a different name on youtube like it's it's pretty wacky um yeah it basically it's just four courses of which one and the one we're concerned with is the data analytics course awesome and what makes your perspective so unique you are i am you know if you can't tell from the screaming moto t-shirt uh i am a current technically united states marine um in the process of retirement and I am interning at Google through an awesome program that they provide to the military called Skillbridge. Is any transitioning service members or future transitioning service members out there? Skillbridge is a, a gift. It is amazing. But um, yeah, working, working at Google in the devices and services division, um, working with the, the Nest, the Google Home series of products, and doing some data management work. It's, it's really, it's fascinating stuff. Awesome. And then kind of on my end of things, what I think I, I where I can provide some unique value is that we're currently launching a learning platform and Ryan Forrest, my marketing manager, he just installed the Google Analytics um, Pixel. So we are tracking our website data. So I think that as we get into some of these later lectures, I would love for you to kind of start to apply some of your, the things you're learning and the insights directly into some real data. So I think that's a unique value prop that I, I haven't seen anyone else doing. Cause I think a lot of people take these courses and it's all this cookie cutter data, but here it's all right. like, all right, let's, let's learn the skill set, let's apply it. And then kind of let's, let's, let's work it all the way through to, you know, a, a business decision or a business outcome. And I think that's doubly beneficial, too, because as I'll talk about later as we go through some of these sections, the the technical application platform in this course, Quick Labs, it's actually kind of a pain in the butt to use. Um, there's a whole lot of steps, you know, the kind of are you a robot crap that you have to go through over and over and over. And it, it kind of wears on you. You get used to it after a while. But um, yeah, to be able to take those lessons and get reps, which is another thing that's kind of missing from this and a lot of other MOOCs is you don't get the reps. It's not like getting homework assigned in, in high school or college where it's like do these 10 problems and after 10, you know the stuff cold um, and you're ready for a test. M most of these courses, it's like, here's the concept. You rep that thing on your own, do your own homework if, if you choose to, but you can get through and get the cert without ever really repping the skills that you learn. And if you don't, if you don't rep the stuff, uh, you're going to lose it. Awesome. Oh, we've got some, some commenters here. 
So, GOB, hello everyone. Greetings from Greece. How's yeah. it going? Thanks for coming and checking this out. All right, Al. So, do you want to start off with just talking at a high level and kind of do this dual screen, or do you want to hop right into a screen share? Um, yeah, let me just intro the uh, kind of, I, I think the five points that I gave last time are okay. kind of especially appropriate to this course. So, let me just kind of recover those, keep them fresh in people's minds. So, Really, the, the biggest thing that I cannot emphasize too much, and this talks directly to the Google Data Thoughts Challenge, is you're going to get out what you put into this. It relates to the reps as well and going and finding projects and things that you can do with these concepts. But it's entirely possible to gain this cert without really learning a whole lot. You don't have to do the capstone project. You can skim through and just kind of do quizzes. And if you've done some work, there's a lot of kind of common sense bonus that if you go through a 10 question quiz, having not seen the material or studied it, you can common sense your way to six or seven right answers uh, and then figure out the rest going back and iterating a quiz. So you get out what you put in. Um, and then second point, learn all the material. All of this stuff is important to Google. This is gonna be very important when I go over this course because it's gonna seem a bit disjointed and it is. Uh, but the important thing to remember is all of the concepts taught in this and all of the eight courses are important to Google. So if you're using this as your value signal that I have the Google seal of approval, I see a lot of people in their headlines saying Google certified data analyst. Awesome. However, just realize when you show up at the gates of Google and say, give me my job, I've got my certificate. They will expect you to know all of the concepts in this course and you can expect them to come up in your interview, I would say. Um, okay, that's. I want to pause you there because um, Luke. Um, I don't know if you the guy Luke. He was like a. I think he's a programmer that kind of tr transitioned into doing See, content a lot analytics. Bruce, that's the one you're talking about. Bruce, yeah, his yeah. video, like I think, is the one that I think he was probably the first person to make a, a video in this lane. And I think in the title it literally says um, how to get a, a Google job without a degree or something like that. Or yep. is this is this certification a substitute for a degree? What are your thoughts yeah. on that? So my thoughts are, I mean, to everyone that has a degree of any kind out there, did you study only your swim lane, your, you know, we both have economics bachelor's degrees. I took many, many classes that were not economics, sociology, psychology, hard sciences, math, stats, all of those, you know, phys ed classes for electives. You know, I learned how to how to serve a tennis ball, for God's sake, at Ohio U. Um, you take a ton of classes that are kind of gen ed, kind of enhance your awareness of the world around you, um, things that the school thinks are important. So why would you expect that a Google data analytics certificate is going to teach you Excel, Tableau, R, and what's the other one? I'm missing one, but skill sets only with no context, and then you're done, you're certified. There are plenty of courses out there that will do that. Google hires real people with, with context, with brains, with, you know, with personalities, with lives. They expect you to understand the business domain. And if you don't, you're a button pusher. And so you're not, you're not terribly, uh, sequel. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, how did I forget that one? That's my <laughs> Anyway, maybe I just take it for granted. We got the audience keeping us honest here. Yep. Thank you guys. <laughs> but um, yeah, just if, if you expect this to take the place of a college degree, treat it as you would a college education. Learn all of it. It's all important. Right. Okay. So from a content creator perspective, I actually wanted to circle back on. So Gerson Mira? said he's going through it now and he absolutely agrees on the labs. So what is the frustration point there? Um, like what, what's, is it, is it just not, the UI is not very it's, intuitive? Yeah, it's very difficult to log in. There are a whole lot of, and, and I have, actually I have kind of a best practice that I've figured out um, that they don't really tell you that, that makes it slightly easier. It doesn't make it easy, uh, but it, it removes a couple of the annoying steps, but it involves, you have to go onto a cloud server to do the work and you can't log in with your Google account. They have to give you kind of a fake Google account that's only generated for that study 
uh, study session. And that's how they give you the data set, kind of keep it Google internal, and then grade it at the end for the ones that are graded and, and show completion. And then you log back out of that cloud server. Um, gotcha. So yeah, that's why I said there's a whole lot of are you a robot and you know all, all the fun stuff involved in that. So we got STR. What's up, brother? Tuning in, and then also, how's it going? Is it Adam? I don't know if I'm pretending. It's uh, it's <laughs> you want on me, but welcome. Is this your first time? Okay, so yeah. it's Gershon. I won't demonstrate it because there's probably some kind of you know permissions involved there, and I, I really yeah. don't want to get myself in trouble at Google because you're kind of my boss right now. But um, <laughs> yeah, just. If you walk through their step action, it's it's doable. There's some there's a learning curve and it gets a little annoying. But yeah, there's some stuff where when you get into the cloud server, it takes they say three to five minutes, but I've there have been times where after 10 minutes I just log out and, and start the whole process over again um, just to bring up the apps. So you have to in this one you have to use Google Sheets. I mean, you'll grow old sometimes sitting there waiting for Google Sheets to come up, and then finally you're just like, all right, it's, it's time for the ONOFF button and, and get back in. Also, we got Samantha Chulis tuning in. How's Hello. it going? Samantha. Thanks for leaving a comment. All right, so what did you want to hop into now? So just to, to finish out, so this course is not going to make you a tool master. Mm -hmm. the, the course writ large, the Google Data Analytics course, is not going to make you a tool master. It will give you the, the basic building blocks of these four uh, analytical tools. This second course especially is not going to make you a tool master because it's still very much in the intro phase. And, and just based on the six phases of data analytics that Google uses, you're in the ask phase, which is a fairly untechnical phase, just no matter what you're doing. Um, fourth point is trust the process. Take your time and learn this stuff. Uh, if, you know, I would say ideally you you draw it out a little bit. Don't do the speed run. Some people are fans of the speed run. I, I don't think that's as effective a, a learning method, but to each his own. Um, and then just keep in mind, this is a soft skills and business domain heavy course and nowhere is that more evident than in these first two, the one we did last week, and then this one in the, the ask questions phase. It's, it's a soft skills course. They're giving you an intro to the tech stuff. So that keep those five things in mind, and I think you you have your head in the right place to to learn the stuff they're trying to teach you. So now, if you want to bring it up, and uh, we'll do uh, a yeah. test drive. Okay. All right. So minimize some stuff here. Okay. So you're in the Google Data Analytics course. This is your got kind of main screen here, and it shows you all the courses. Last week we did Data Data Everywhere. You can see. And one thing you'll note is I don't think this is entirely based on the time involved. 9,500 ratings for day to day everywhere, 2,000 reviews, drops down to under 3,400 reviews for course two. So that tells me there's a whole lot of people, like many MOOCs, are signing on for this thing, taking the first course, and either saying, that's not really what I, would, what I bargained for, or saying, I'm bored, and, and throw it in the trash. Um, and you see it kind of it decreases kind of more steadily from there, you know, and you go down to the rest of them. It's, it's declining each time. I think after the first few, you can chalk that up to just there are people still working their way through. Mm -hmm. um, you can probably say that most of these 1,500 at least are still working through, but that's a precipitous drop off right there. So I would tell the people in this audience, hey, the first two courses are squishy. They're not super technical. Just bear with it. There's a lot of concepts and domain that they that Google needs you to understand. Okay, now going into this is actually the second course right here. Um, and so let me back up just a second. Open this up. Nope, never mind. Okay, so you've got your your four weeks here, and let me just give you the names of the four weeks, and you're gonna you're gonna see what what we're leaning into here that. This course is a bit disjointed. Um, these, it does not have a great flow to it, and all the topics are not gonna relate super well to the overall topic. I have some thoughts on why that happened um, that maybe we can touch on at the end. It's kind of inside baseball for how Coursera it does business with their courses, um, but it's, it's a shortish course and it's a little disjointed. So the four weeks are titled Asking Effective Questions. Okay, that relates. Making Data-Driven Decisions, 
And at the end of week two, you kind of asking effective questions, making data driven decisions, you've kind of got the sum total of what they said the course is about right there. You still got two more weeks. Week three is more spreadsheet basics. And week four is always remember the stakeholder. Stakeholder relates to asking questions. They don't do a great job of relating it here. But like I said, there's some disjointed stuff here. All important, all worth your time, but not necessarily all under the ask phase of the six step process, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so while we're paused here, yep. so how do you, on Trent, I feel like half of the video is me trying I'm to pronounce on. people from all over the world's names. <laughs> so in addition to Google, certificate course, I've been building skills in data science by Jemaine by contributing to open source projects via GitHub and Kaggle. This is an excellent point and I wanted to kind of hammer down on this. So um, if you have been following the podcast for a while, then you've seen the Jay Sueno video where he got his first job at Amazon. And he literally started his own nonprofit and talked about how he can use data uh, to drive his decisions in his organization. So that was one of the biggest things, the biggest feather in his cap of getting his his analytics job at Amazon. So absolutely, I think you should pair this course with some something that's that's actually real and something like um, I, I was actually I was tagged in one of um, Harpreet's uh, from Artists of Data Science uh, post, and the question was, what did you wish that you did? um sooner on your analytics journey and someone said i wish i watched less videos and i wish i built more things so yep. i think what, with this course you can kind of do both you can learn and like um this person saying start to contribute and start building things so it's like a you need the knowledge but then you need also to apply and you need that experience and you can get that experience before you have someone paying you and telling you to go on and, and start building things. Yep, absolutely. And just like like on touches on here, you're going to get one rep in this course. When they introduce you to spreadsheets and they say, here are the formulas, here, here are the functions, you're getting one rep and then they'll give you a cheat sheet. It's on you to go to GitHub, Kaggle, uh, and these other sites and go the, the U.S. Uh, the name escapes me, but the, the government uh, source for open data sets, go get some data sets and play with these things on your own. That's how you're going to get better. Um, and I know Mike Larnick, huge proponent of GitHub as well. Um, you know, when he interviews people for jobs, absolutely. He looks straight for their GitHub and sees what's on there. Okay. So Haddon is asking, well, I'm really thinking about getting some applied knowledge and data analytics to use in my construction career. Do you have any recommendations for a specific application? So yeah, I've got some thoughts on I this. I would probably I have to know more answer. about the, the business domain that he's working mm -hmm. in. Um, yeah, I, that, that would have to be a conversation. Okay, so Hannah, um, something that that, that you should consider is, I, I don't know the position that you're in specifically, but if you can take a systematic approach to, for example, if you're in construction, I'm sure that there's, there are costs coming in and then there's, you know, a potential value. Um, if, if you can build a spreadsheet that somewhat gathers multiple of these data sources together and combines them into a system, I think that that is step one. That's, that's where you can start to, um, as Tim Ferriss says, like build your own little fiefdom. If you can start to think about, I'm managing the process and here's the data in, here's you know the series of the lookups and the formulas to calculate the return on investment. Anytime that I get a new data source, I can just add it to this system. Um, so yeah, you, can, you could start there. Um, I think that that's probably, um, I actually had a student who took the learning platform who did something very, very similar to this. Yeah. So um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I would say if, Adam, if you're going through this course, I think that this is giving you the basic building blocks. Obviously there's some qualms with people saying that they wished it, it had Python versus R. We'll get to that. They address that debate. That there are fans of Power BI over Tableau or Click or some of these other uh, platforms, but you know, the, the there's, 
wide agreement that if you can work with spreadsheets, if you can work with SQL and query databases, and if you can use a, a basic coding language is good, but using a, a BI visualization platform, one of the, one of the big ones, um, you, you're well on your way. And, and going beyond that, then you're probably delving into data science. If, if what you want to do is analytics and apply it to a business domain and you're not looking to completely geek out, I think by the time you finish this course, you're at least going to know where you need to go um, and, and you'll have all the basic building blocks you need. Now, if you just want to go up and look, go and look up a MOOC on, you know, Excel, SQL, Tableau, and R or Python, that, that's up to you too. Um, right. So, I, but I think the key word here is applied. How do you get applied knowledge? And that's really, um, Adam, that's, that's on you to be a creative problem solver, essentially. Yeah. So you need to go, and I mean, it kind of relates back to the topics within this course of um, asking asking the right questions. So you know, maybe some questions to start is, all right, what what is the what is the end goal? What are the key factors that determine success? And then underneath that, what are the underlying data sources we have to study and track whether we're hitting our mark or we're not? So I guess that that's a little bit of a framework that you could put that into. Yep. Um, we also, we've got a question here from Juan. Um, what are the best questions to ask to obtain a data analytics job? All right, so that's a little off topic here, but I'm not gonna leave you hanging, Juan. In literally the previous podcast episode, um, we had John Weininger, who was the analytics manager at Home Depot. He did a mock interview with Abe Diaz, who's one of our super fans, which I'm, Abe, I'm a little surprised that you're not on the live stream here. You, you usually make every one of them. So they did a 30 minute um, Zoom interview um, ahead of time. And then in the live stream, what we did was we watched back that 30 minute interview and did a play by play. So if you're concerned about what questions to ask in an interview, which is kind of how I'm interpreting this question, um, they specifically talk about that in the previous podcast episode. So I'd go check that out. Yep. Yeah, and if you go through this course, I mean, there, there is plenty of talk about asking good questions and what categories to use. So I think if you if you master these concepts, you will help yourself get an analytics job. I don't, there's no switch you can flip that says, now I'm qualified. But uh, anyway, go, uh, going on into the course material. So, so this is Jimena. I lied last week. I said Tony was my favorite. Jimena is awesome. Um, and just for a quick aside, I, I think um, the importance of good instruction cannot be overstated. Uh, I, I think we take this as gospel when it comes to a brick and mortar classroom. Um, if you are going to an actual school and you're sitting in front of a professor, you know exactly how tiring it can be to, to receive even the most wonderful class from a terrible professor. Um, there are good ones out there and there are bad ones out there. And the good ones, you got to seek them out and you got to take every class they offer, you know, assuming it relates to your degree. I think that we kind of dismiss this when it comes to online courses. We absolutely should not. When I was first starting out, I took, uh, I, I signed on to Data Camp and I started taking Python courses. And the initial Python courses are taught by a dude named Hugo Bowne Anderson, who is just magnificent. And those were great. I learned a ton from them. I breezed through them. Once you got into the intermediate ones, instructors weren't so great. When you went to the SQL courses, again, instructors weren't so great. Um, props to Google for pulling these. These are not professional instructors. Um, everyone here has a title. You see finance data analyst. They pulled people out of the organization that are just amazing at talking to the camera and explaining concepts. Um, and yeah, Kamen is awesome. So. Uh, you're in good hands for course number two. So kind of scrolling down, you're going to get through to, um, once you get through the intro stuff, here's something, this is the learning log. A little disappointed they didn't use this more or more effectively. Um, and I wound up just keeping a physical log myself of notes and things that I've learned and, and kind of thoughts in the margins. Um, this, this learning log I felt like was underutilized or at least has been, I'm halfway through the course now and it, it's just not 
I was excited the concept of this. It's a little clunky and difficult to learn. Again, I was surprised that Google had, this is not a great user interface and, and Quick Labs also not a great user interface. But learning log, these are worthwhile exercises. Um, and, and these early ones are a bit conceptual and you'll see this when it comes to the discussion posts. You know, think about the word data. What does it mean to you? Um, how would you describe data to someone who's unfamiliar with the word? Squishy concepts. Um, it's, it's kind of using your creative brain, but it's the intro part of the course and it's trying to get you into that analytical mindset. So moving into, you're starting to pick up that every, every one of these courses starts with a discussion prompt that is titled meet and greet. And it's just same thing, kind of conceptual thinking about uh, about what the course is about. So this one says you might consider how asking effective questions has helped you analyze a financial decision. And then you kind of talk about that. This is not hardcore analytics. Again, it's called meet and greet. It's just to talk about how you've asked questions to, to do data-driven decisions. But all of these are worth doing because you're going to get you into that mindset. And also, it's going to get you writing. To go through your data analytics roadmap, this is going to pop up in every course. And then you're going back to the speed track. I will reiterate my opinion on the speed track. If you are such a data professional, if you are so experienced that you can say without a shadow of a doubt, I don't need to learn these early concepts, by all means, do the speed track. If you are using the, the Google data cert as a value signal and you're saying that this makes me qualified, I, I would go through everything, even if you're already a professional data analyst, because like I said, there's a lot of conceptual and domain knowledge concepts passed here um, that even if you know them well are, are good for a refresher. So I do not recommend the speed track unless you are one of these ones that is just, just gonna power through and say, got the cert, check in the box. Um, and if you're, if you're not here to learn Google's method and their kind of internal way of thinking, then I, I question why you're taking the course in the first place. Not casting aspersions on anyone, just say. Okay. So take action with data. Um, and this is where they start getting into the six data analysis phases. Um, this, is, this is a good reference right here. And this is telling you their six phases. Again, this relates to why this, this course is a little disjointed and short, because you can see the ask phase is a little bit squishy. Um, and I think they just had to make a whole course out of ask, um, which is kind of the problem. Again, some, um, some good kind of conceptual comments, crafting effective questions. Uh, this is a good one right here. And they've got an acronym called SMART, which I've heard other places. So I don't think that's a Google internal thing, but crafting SMART questions uh, this is an acronym that stands for specific, measurable, action-oriented, relevant, and time-bound. And this is supposed to guide you in how to, to ask questions that is going to enable your data analysis. It's a great thing to think of. They have an exercise here where you, you are meant to read this. I highly recommend you read this, as I recommend you do all of these pieces. And then you're actually going to... Some of these quizzes are actually, it says self-reflection. It's either a writing or kind of an exercise where you have to go out and talk to people, God forbid. Um, so in this one, you're actually tasked to go out and ask people that you know smart questions that would enable some kind of analysis, okay? And then there's a, there's a discussion later, this discussion prompt, which we won't use in the Google Data Thoughts Challenge, that says, okay, tell us what you found out. So there's a lot of things in here. Again, this gets you into that analytic mindset. It's not necessarily super technical, but it's definitely worth doing. Do you have any questions or comments? <clears throat> uh, sorry, it uh, cut off. Did you say no questions or comments so far? Okay. So week two is under our um, data and decisions, right? So understanding the power of data. And the reading here, this one is really great. So it's titled Data Trials and Triumphs. And it's got some awesome examples of massive failures in, in business and here uh, with NASA, where they failed to ask the right questions, leading to 
uh, improper data analysis, which then lead to a, a you know a catastrophic loss of some form, either a catastrophic loss of money, time, or equipment. The one that I kind of wish they had included here was the Challenger explosion. Um, I urge you to go study the Challenger explosion and exactly what happened with that, because that also was a failure to ask the right questions and a failure of, of teamwork, a failure of leadership, and a failure of data analysis. Um, they, they were kind of under a lot of pressure to everybody say yes, say yes, say yes, get the launch off, and they took off with faulty equipment that could not handle the, the atmospheric and weather conditions. And as a result, lives were lost. Um, I don't know if that was too sensitive to include here, or maybe the the case is a little more complicated than these. These are fair, fairly easy to understand. Those of us that are old enough to remember New Coke uh, in the mid 80s, um, Coke went out and did a lot of taste tests with some, you know, with a sample group. And a sample group said, yes, this new formula of Coke is better. Um, it tastes better. It may well have. There are questions as to whether the sample group was uh, was good enough or was appropriate, but Coke launched new Coke and it was one of the most catastrophic business failures of all time up there with like the Edsel. I mean, it's um, it, it was a giant flop. It cost Coke probably hundreds of millions back then. If they did it today, it'd be billions, I'm sure. Um, but they, they failed to ask the right questions and they failed to consider their brand and how traditional their customers were um, and so really good example here of how asking the wrong questions or not asking enough questions leads to a business failure and, and a failure of analytics. Um, let's see, we got a question on the screen. So I must admit, Gerson, I did not go out and ask uh, smart questions. Um, I should have. I will do that. I, I believe I try and uh, ask questions like that just kind of every day. Like I said, the smart questions is not a new concept and I don't think it was invented by Google. I've definitely heard that term before. Um, yeah, I, I definitely put that into action in my, in my job. Um, but no, for this exercise, I did not actually go out and talk to someone. So you caught me, I'm busted. Uh, not taking my own medicine when it came to that question itself. Um, and then they tell some, some successes. One of them that kind of everybody is familiar with is video streaming recommender algorithms and how that is, is a form of asking data related questions and then turning that into accurate predictions and a, a worthwhile product that they can sell to customers. People like Netflix for a whole lot of reasons, people like Amazon for a whole lot of reasons, not video streaming, but, um, but they like them for a whole lot of reasons. But the biggest reason is just you search for this thing and I show you these hundred other things that our algorithm says you would be interested in. Some are right, some are wrong, some are good, some are trash, but that algorithm has value and it has actual business value to customers. So these are successes. Um, same thing with uh, as a fast food, um, making the service faster here. Um, or doing loyalty programs where they can predict what you're going to want at a certain time, offer you a coupon, uh, that sort of thing. So these are successes of asking questions, making data-driven decisions, and, and making money, which is, uh, you know, if you're in the for-profit space, that's what you're in it for anyway. All right. So uh, Gerson, and I feel like I'm butchering these names. I, I guess I just need to, like, push through. <laughs> So Chris and I, um, so he said, me neither, let's do the now. So do you, Al, do yeah. you want to ask me some smart questions? Oh, right now? I don't know. I mean, do we have a problem set? Uh, yeah, we're la launching a learning platform. I think there are pretty, plenty of problems there. Okay, uh, John David. Uh, so I'm putting you on the spot to put me on the spot. It's like uh, turtles all the way down of spot on the pudding, on, on the spot pudding. <laughs> so what, what is the price point on the learning platform? Okay, so right now we're, we're doing, we're launching the case study modules and it's, we're doing each individual course for $100, but bundling them for 250. And I actually wanted to talk um, about how, so you saw that precipitous drop off from module one to module two. 
I think that is extremely common in these lower, lower cost online courses. So I bet that's a whole other tangent because I I see the same thing with my Power BI courses on Udemy. I mean, we've had 35,000 people take that course and I would say 90% don't get past like the first chapter. Yeah. Well, that and it, it deals with the way Coursera structures it. It's a monthly subscription service, so you're not paying by the course, so you don't feel that pain. It, it might be a different thing if you paid forty bucks for course one, done, um, mm-hmm. and then you complete it, and then you have this appetite for course two, and you got to shell out another forty bucks. Well, if you if you scoot up and and do course two, then you can get them both for forty bucks. If you dilly dally then you start getting annoyed because you're not through the first course and you already shelled out 40 bucks for the first month. Then you get dinged for 40 bucks for the next month. I think that's probably why people are dropping off. Mm. They hit that kind of lull where the initial excitement wears off and then they get mad that they're wasting money and they figure, well, I'll circle back later because it's a sunk cost at this point. Okay. So it's G like a J. So Jerson, Jerson, Miera. Jerson. So we were pronouncing oh, wow. it correctly. All right. So was was that the 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 whole smart question? Was what are we pricing it at? Um, sorry, I, when you were going through the smart thing, I was look, I was checking out. Um, I mean, that's specific. Industry. That's measurable. That's I don't have the whole thing written down, and I've already clicked away from it. Uh, okay. Time bound. Yeah, I didn't. So I didn't give you a task to to answer and come back to me. But yeah, if I said, uh, "Hey, John David, can you come back to me with a, a you know." in half an hour, the summary of the costs associated with the course, then we're, then we're time bound. It's definitely relevant. What was that? Okay. Anyway, I should look back at it. But. Right. Okay. Just, uh, there you yeah, go. I, I, oriented. You immediately gave me an answer. There you go. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, we, we, I don't know if we want to go off on that tangent, but I, it was $1,500 to get the website built out. And then I, I think it's, um, ten dollars a month to host the website right. so um i mean we could I, I have kind of thought about using it as a platform to teach business to analysts as well so like we could do a um kind of a break-even analysis there as well yeah. but um let's let's stay focused on on the course though okay. um and unless i mean if if the audience wants to kind of uh, we can do like analysis on the course business using the Google framework, but um, let's kind of like keep it within the bounds of the Coursera yep. framework. Absolutely. All right. So we have um, Ashish saying after the second module, I understand that asking right and necessary questions will give you what are the stakeholders ex- expectations. And those questions will lead you to ask questions yourself when you start analyzing the data. Just yeah, absolutely. Thought. And there's there's talk about stakeholders here in these first two weeks. The problem is that, as you see when we get there, that fourth week, it talks about stakeholders and kind of how to deal with them. But it really, it does a poor job of relating it to the overall ask questions theme. Um, and so it feels kind of like a standalone unit, which I think it is. But uh, yeah, we'll get to that. But yeah, Asish, definitely. Um, um, and, and what's up, Asish? Like, Good, uh, good talking to you lately. Um, yeah, absolutely. The stakeholder thing does relate. You do have to ask questions of stakeholders, but we'll, we'll get to that fourth week and it's it's kind of its own thing. Um, so um, again, I recommend these discussion prompts. I'm actually gonna use this one in the Google Data Thoughts Challenge, uh, using data in everyday life and kind of what, how do you use data? This is kind of a good, to me, creative writing exercise. This is not, you know, it's not like, hey, show me your Tableau uh, graph. It's, it's think about how data relates to your life and how you can ask questions to enhance that. Um, so once again, do the discussion prompts. And, and one other thing that I recommend is, what I like to do is go through, if you see someone that's really doing a good job of, of thoughtfully answering the questions, like, hey, David Carter, I don't mean to put you on blast, but one is not an answer. Peter or a Zulike, okay is not an answer. Ayrton, uh, that's blank. So Elizabeth Barrera, props to you wherever you are. Got you an upvote. And I think if you see like a really thoughtful, like this one from Yu Chin Yang, um, give it an up, upvote and then reply to it. That's the intent here is that you're engaging with 
the community of data analysts and the, the people that are going through the course with you. So really take some time, discussion prompt, 10 minutes. You can rip out an answer in 10 minutes and a couple little responses, easy day, um, and put some thought into it, okay? And, and you'll be better for it at the end. So to get into qualitative and quantitative data, it's it's a good thing. It's, it's a bit of a dry subject. It relates to kind of how you're directing your questions. You know, do you want the, the squishy kind of feelings-based answer, or do you want something very objective? Like I asked John David, hey, what's your price point? Um, then following on to that, I might have asked him after that, if I wanted some more qualitative uh, data, what was your thinking behind setting the price point there, which he talked through anyway, but you know, continuing on those smart questions, uh, mix of qualitative and quantitative. You, you can't just get the numbers, you need to know why they exist and what the business demand says. And here you're going to talk about your smart questions and quiz. So here in follow the evidence, um, this is a pretty good, again, kind of a standalone thing. They start talking about designing compelling dashboards. This doesn't relate super well to asking questions and making data driven decisions. It's very useful. Um, and they, they start introducing the concept of why we use dashboards and what's great about it and how, how it communicates to stakeholders, but it's related quite poorly. You don't see much in here about asking questions, making data-driven decisions. Dashboards are part of a business journey. Wonderful. It doesn't really relate to the overall topic. And then connecting the data docs. Again, this is just some more kind of mindset stuff, mathematical thinking. This is a good video. Um, understanding the difference between big data and small data, very useful um, and something you're going to have to deal with going forward. And that is week two. It's kind of short, just, just three segments there. Okay. And then we get kind of this left turn into crazy town, which is not, uh, not really part of the overall theme It's definitely worthwhile working with spreadsheets. Now, Digging in here into spreadsheets, you can see, okay, this says optional refresher. This is Evan, he's super cool too. Welcome to Quick Labs. Now. So he's kind of your tech advisor, um, digging the hat and, and the whole lot. He actually humorously acknowledges what a pain in the butt it is getting in and out of Quick Labs. And he actually, he'll take you on a test drive through it and he'll show you how you have to pull up an incognito window you have to prove you're not a robot multiple times. You have to sit there and go, well, is that the wheel of the school bus in that quadrant there or not? Is this car a taxi cab or just a regular? All of that fun stuff we've grown to know and love. Um, and he's laughing as he does it, and he's, he's kind of apologizing for it. So I think it's funny that, that Google kind of acknowledges, hey, this really does kind of suck that you have to do this every time you get, uh, get a quick lab. These initial quick labs, this is just taking you through spreadsheet basics. Because it's Google, they're gonna take you through Google Sheets. Now they're gonna to talk to you about Excel as well, um, but the instruction is mostly in Google Sheets. And that'll come into play here in a minute when they start showing some of the shortcuts. Um, when it says ungraded external tool, that basically it just shows completion. And that's why you go into Quick Labs, it can evaluate that you completed it, it sends some sort of signal back to your account, uh, and it says complete at the bottom. Or you can just click complete, like I said, you, you get out what you put into it. If you want to cheat going through these courses, that option is there for you. Um, so anyway, Kimena's back. She starts taking you through some demonstrations on spreadsheets, um, and those are great. You start going into, so they talk about spreadsheet basics. There's a whole lot of great assets here um, for free training, um, free cheat sheets with the functions and formulas, which they'll get into. Um, these are really good for people that are not super facile Excel and Google Sheets users. So I recommend checking that out. Obviously, it's part of the course, so you should check it out. So then they start talking about formulas and functions. This whole section here is, is about formulas. Understanding formulas is, is just crucial to being able to effectively use Excel. Um, there, there are kind of two kinds of Excel users. There's the point and click and hand jam in data. Um, and those are, the, you might as well be 
pencil on paper at that point. Excel is doing almost nothing for you other than having it on a computer screen. If you want to use Excel properly or a spreadsheet function like Google Sheets, you need to get good at formulas and functions. And then you will be amazed, if you haven't done it before, you'll be amazed with all of the hotkeys and the shortcuts, how much of the work that programs will actually do for you. So this is great reading. There are some great cheat sheets in here. They go formulas, they go functions. Kimetta does some great, um, I'm using the word great way too much. She does some awesome, awesome demonstrations. Like I said, she's an excellent teacher. And then you're gonna go into a quick lab uh, and do some kind of execution on those formulas and functions. This is a fantastic section. Like I said, does not relate to asking questions for data-driven decisions. It's just to get you into spreadsheets so that they can start to build on your tech skills later in the course. And then again, you've got kind of an unrelated concept here, structured thinking, awesome concept, very, very good to study. Um, and, and it's, sorry, go to the reading. Um, it's talking about context, it's talking about how you should break down a problem. It's into the analytic mindset doesn't really relate to week three, doesn't really relate super well to the overall course, but it is very important and you should definitely go through it. Week three has four sections and we're just about done. Jerson, did I run into issues where I went to Quick Labs, clicked on the progress check button and it didn't recognize when you where you were in the lab? That doesn't sound familiar, um, but I am not so naive that I assume that I have gotten to the end of the issues with Quick Lab. I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of bugaboos that, that I haven't got to yet. But yeah, that sounds annoying. Um, and honestly, you know what, I'll, I'll give you, because we're talking through the Quick Labs and I think we're through all the, there, I don't think there are any Quick Labs in week four, because we're kind of done talking about Quick Labs for this course, I will tell you, here's, here's the, it's not a cheat, it's just a best practice. If you log into Coursera with a username and password, rather than your Google account, you will skip steps in logging into and out of, well, logging into Quick Labs. Um, there's a couple steps where you have to go into an incognito window. You paste the link in to log into Coursera. If you log into Coursera with your Google account, you then have an extra step where once you're into the Quick Lab, or once you're getting into the Quick Lab, you have to go log out of your Gmail in the incognito window. Mind blowing. But if you just log into Coursera with a username and password in the incognito window, you don't have to do that step where you log out of Gmail or, or all Google um, assets. If you don't, if you use your Google account to log into Coursera, and then you don't go log out of, of Google in general, the sheets won't come up. None of the none of the applications are going to come up, and it's a pain. Um, so, just take my word for it. Go through all the step actions that Google tells you to do with Quick Labs. But just when you get in the incognito window, log into Coursera with a username and password. Trust me on this. You save yourself, you know, a minute or two of of extra pain in the butt every time you go in. If you got questions on that, just uh, send me a message on LinkedIn, and I'll be happy to explain it. So week four, again, does not relate to the overall topic. Stakeholders, balancing team and stakeholder needs, communication and teamwork. It doesn't, even the days of week four don't relate super well to each other. However, they're all useful. So I recommend that you go through them. So week four is all mindset. Like I said, there's no quick labs. It's pretty much all squishiness and concept and analytical mindset. So you got communicating your team, balancing needs and expectations across your team, and working with stakeholders. Now, they, they get very specific with how they define stakeholders here and who the teams are. A lot of this is kind of overly prescriptive. And you'll see you get into communication is key. These tips for effective communication are really good. Um, and, and But this gets a little overly prescriptive for my taste. Um, you know, and it goes through a couple examples of how to break down your audience um, and, and identify your stakeholders. 
Well, this seems a bit Google specific without acknowledging that it's Google specific. Um, and so I was kind of a minor gripe at this point, but um, yeah. So they, they do get into a lot of videos with other people from Google. Here's Sarah, senior analytical leader. I'm um, Sarah, and I'm a senior. And it's really good when they bring these other people in and that bring a special perspective that isn't shared by the, the course narrator. This reading is awesome right here on the limitations of data. Um, and this identifies a ton of very common issues, dirty data, um, you know, misaligned, if you have missing data, things that you can go through. The videos are great here too. Um, and, and this is a wonderful section right here. Super useful information. Like I said, a bit overly prescriptive, doesn't relate to the overall topic, but very important. Um, so good communication skills. And then teamwork skills, again, e even more kind of overly prescriptive, but good guidelines, you know, making your meetings useful, give people an agenda beforehand. Can't emphasize that enough. I've seen that done wrong so many, so many, so many times. Um, and then another uh, pretty good discussion. And then my last highlight for this course, I must say. And we use all sorts of computers to do our artillery. Yes, they brought in an actual Marine and an artilleryman to boot. So this, this made me stand up and cheer. Um, so Nathan, props to you. Google, thanks for bringing this man in. Uh, Google has a thriving veterans network, which uh, I'm now a member of. So um, yeah, this was really cool that, that he just talks through, kind of uh, served in Iraq and how he took his military mindset and, and brought it to Google. So uh, kind of more to follow on that. They have a big vet net event. If we got any veterans on the line, I know Abe's not here, but he already knows about it. Um, and that is the long and the short of it. Ask questions to make data-driven decisions. As you can see, I gave it five stars. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of gave them all five stars. It's This one is rated a skosh lower than one and three. You can see there's, there's some kind of but hurt later on in five and six. I haven't gotten to those yet, but yeah, you can see it's not quite as highly rated as the rest of them. Um, and I think that's probably because it's it's a bit disjointed. It's still a bit squishy. I think people probably had some angst about, you know, I'm through the second course and I really haven't done much technical. Um, so there may be some disappointment there. Well, that's definitely something we see all the time on the podcast. Yep. It's like everyone wants to jump directly into hard skills, hard skills, hard skills. Yep. Um, what What is your kind of read or your feeling on their take on soft skills? You think it's, do you think, well, I guess, let me frame it up this way. Is there anything that we're talking about that they're not or something they're talking about that we're not on our podcast? Um, I feel like it's, they're still going. I mean, they sprinkle it throughout. So no, I don't, I don't think they're missing anything. And I know that later in the course, I, mean, I watched uh, Matt's reviews and I know later in the course, they start giving you kind of a transition phase. And so they start talking about interview skills and hey, I was, um, <laughs> good to see you. they don't have a picture. Um, we know what Iris looks like. Anyway, um, they, they give, kind of a, a transition phase. And it's like, here's how to interview, here's how to job hunt. There's a section coming up, not to give any spoilers, but there's a section coming up that is optional, do it. It's on <laughs> using LinkedIn and getting into the data community, which is a topic that is obviously near and dear to my heart. Um, and, and there's some great guidance in there. There's also great guidance in both of my appearances uh, as a guest on how to get an <laughs> job. But, um, and, and you know, PM me for, for whatever questions you have. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they sprinkle probably everything in there. I think there's some problem solving, some interpersonal relations stuff. So you can get a smattering of everything. And that's part of the reason why I stress, hit, hit all the wickets. Don't, don't skip any portions of this. Uh, apparently people like seeing our faces, hey there. <laughs> The shot, is that how you say it? Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I think that, how did you feel about this episode? Do you feel like um, going in deep? 
I mean, are there any things that you want to reiterate? Like what, like kind of like the big takeaways? Yeah, I just think, so I think that Google had to sort of shoehorn some extra information into this course mm -hmm. to get it out there. And I think they, they've got a six step data process. Obviously ask is not the most robust of those six steps. So you've got eight courses. Course one is the intro and overview. Course eight is the project. So you got six courses of kind of meat on the bone there that, that relate to their six steps. Ask is the squishiest and the most conceptual, the most sort of touchy feely mindset oriented thing, but it's also the leanest. So they went through in two weeks, really what, what the ask phase should look like. I think that Coursera, the way Coursera constructs their courses, they want to have them be unitary. So you can take lesson one and say, OK, I'm out. I want my cert and, and hop off. I think they want an option available there. So when somebody says, I don't really care about the overall certificate for the data analytics, but what I do want is a crash course in Tableau and kind of understand the concepts around visualization. So they can skip straight to course six, knock it out and hop off and they're only out 40 bucks um, and, and you know maybe a week or two of actual study time. So with that, I think that Google had to make this second course a full course. And right. so if they only had two weeks worth of stuff with ask questions to make data-driven decisions, then they had to put at least a week or two more stuff in there that didn't necessarily relate to that topic, but is also important. So that's why you get the, here's how to work with spreadsheets and here's how to deal with stakeholders. Didn't necessarily fit in the first course, which was, was a bit heavier anyway, um, but second course is a, as good a place as any to start getting into those mindset things. The other thing is if you, if you click on it, they estimate the second course at 17 hours of study time. That's by far the shortest. The rest of them are like in the kind of low to mid twenties. Um, so the, it seems like they had to struggle to get enough content into the second course to, to make it its own course. Like I said, it's all worthwhile. It's all good stuff to study, but it's not a unitary course. It's, it's a bunch of disparate comment or, or concepts that have been combined together. Awesome. Well, uh, looks like we have earned a new fan in Jerson. So There's you guys are great. Thanks for reviewing one course at a time, wonderful idea, and look forward to more of your videos. Thanks, thanks for tuning in, Jerson. And also, thanks for um, interacting with us. I feel like uh, this ep this, pod this episode has been a little bit light in interaction. Um, anybody that's listening to the live stream, do you guys have any questions, thoughts, concerns? Um, I, I feel like this is probably just because of the, the chapter. I mean, there's not, it there's seems bad. like, yeah, it seems like, yeah, we're, we're, I'll be honest, we did a piss poor job of advertising this thing. So apologies <laughs> to the super fans for that. If you missed it, obviously you can get on the, the recording. It lives forever on YouTube. Um, well, I've got some smart questions for that, for that, Mr. Social Media Manager. What's going on there? No, yeah, I'm <laughs> Yeah, Google, Google's taking up too much of my time. Um, so anyway, we, we discussed pre-show that we shall get yeah. notifications out there for future episodes better we are going to try and be consistent with this noon on wednesday time i hope you guys like that time if not let me know iris i'm doing great at google um my only my only problem is there's only 24 hours in the day um so i i have so many lines of effort going on that uh you know i have to kind of concentrate on one at a time and that's why stuff like telling everybody about uh live streams on wednesday falls a bit by the wayside so yeah, I see where I stand in your hierarchy of priorities. <laughs> you should ask some of my lieutenants where their fitness reports are. Um, uh, <laughs> well, I guess I'm above them, so yeah. I'm not low. You're, you're in the, in the, uh, <laughs> my lieutenants are, are a priority too. They're, they're all wonderful priorities. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's like I said, it's just you got to pick your days and say, I'm going to surge on Google today. I'm going to surge on studying this course today. I'm going to surge on analytics jobs. So um, you got to have a main effort. So military awesome. guys will know what I'm talking about. All right. So Nikita. I think, I think a new name. I don't think I've seen Nikita before. Okay. Uh, so Nikita Sharma, she asked, while doing this course, I understood the concepts but failed to build effective questions, even though I follow the concepts. For me mm -hmm. personally, lack of business background was a drawback. 
I'm actually really glad that she's saying this because this is the hunch. So with the learning platform that we're building, um, kind of one of the subversive themes is teaching business to non-business people. So yeah. what we're doing is we're, we're building a platform and we're just like, here's the data. So you can see our survey data that we're collecting. You can see our Google analytics data. Um, and we can also sh share our social media data too. Um, Cause I, so I've taught at High Point University in Greensboro College and it's, it's tough um, kind of going from like a STEM field into business. But I think what we're trying to do, at least on some level, is make learning business fun and palatable. So like you don't have to go through this boring, stodgy, like I'm a professor on the board, here are the three points, you know, here are the here are the three departments within business. It's like, no, it's like I'm I'm a social media influencer. Let's break down my little micro business and it's real data and it's fun and it's palatable. Yep. And it's like instead of like this theoretical widget, it's like, well, we sell courses and we sell like our really our currency is like influence, which is really, really strange. But we, we've got even more. So, okay. And also, oh, this is someone new. So, sure. Nisha, Nisha, uh, can you tell a tell a can you tell in short about your internship experience at Google? Kind sir. So it's awesome that you asked that because yeah, it just occurred to me that it occurred to me before, but I was just reminded it relates very well to the topic of this course. The aim to the previous question, really. So I have no real business domain experience. I'm not, I don't have a retail background, at least not recently. Um, I don't, you know, and I'm working in retail. I don't understand the, all of the acronyms at Google. So a lot of my initial uh, information gathering with the project that I'm working on was just going in and trying to ask smart questions. And a, a lot of them were kind of unsmart. They were, you know, not, not super specific, um, not necessarily terribly time bound. It was just, can you please tell me about your job and your information requirements, your data requirements, and then just letting the, the other person talk. And, you know, with the more talkative ones, the, the problem for me was just kind of keeping them on track. Um, I gave them all a read ahead, so an agenda, and so that, you know, that good meeting practice tied in there. I uh, gave them a read ahead of, hey, here's the five questions that I plan to ask you. Where it goes from there is, you know, based on you and your experience. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of just, just information gathering, and boy, do I have a ton of information, some of it useful, some of it just interesting. But uh, I haven't met a boring person there yet. And it's, you know, just everybody that I call up is, is super helpful. But it, it's just a ton of how do I aggregate all of this spoken information and all of these. I've got slide decks for days, some of which I can barely have find time to read through. And how do I tie all this information together, pull out the stuff that's relevant to my project and come to some sort of satisfactory conclusion that is my challenge. Um, so it's fascinating. I love meeting all the people. Um, yeah, it's a, I, I've had a wonderful experience. I absolutely um, am super happy with the decision to uh, to take the internship at Google. But appreciate the question. It's it's a lot of a lot of just getting to know people and getting to know their their business domain and, and how they work. Okay, I've got a follow up question to that question. So uh, Elizabeth Illig, uh, the previous co-host of the podcast, uh, she mentioned quite frequently this concept of portable skills. Um, how well does what's written on your shirt there, what, what of that experience ports over to the, the what, what, do they, what do you guys call the military, the private sector, the business world? Civilian sector. Civilian sector, oh. So what, yeah, are there any lessons or skill sets or perspectives that you feel like give you a unique advantage? So, so many, um, <laughs> yes. So it, it's, it's strange because when I mid-career, when I became an officer and I became an artillery officer, and that was because I wanted a technical challenge. And I love artillery because it is a, it is a quick thinking game. It is a, it's a data analytics game. It's how do I find a solution for this particular technical problem set? And you know how many rounds is it? What kind? How do I fire them? You know what's safe? What's not safe? 
and you have to make quick split second decisions. So really they, they train artillery officers to almost be kind of quick thinking human computers. That was the challenge that I wanted when I took this job. The thing that I found over time and as you get promoted higher and higher is it is all personnel management, it is all interpersonal relations and the technical phase and the importance of the technical goes away quite rapidly. And I, honestly, I wasn't super ready for it because I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I do enjoy interpersonal yeah. as well, but it's all, I mean, how, how do you leverage people? How do you, how do you lead people that you, you have 10 Marines and the first five, you can yell and shout and throw knife hands at them um, and, and tell them to you know, obey orders and they go do it. The next five need something different. Uh, one guy needs you to, to put your arm around his shoulder and say, hey, I need you to, to jump on the team and help me out here. And then he'll go do whatever you need him to do. That there's you know, a female Marine three steps down that, that you need to explain your reasoning to or, or she won't comply. Um, how do you get, and that is a very transferable skill because that's, that's exactly what business leadership is. You've got to have the domain knowledge and, and the tech ability to at least understand what the business is doing and what your data is telling you. But far more than that, I mean, you've got a team of people and they all have to be led a different way. And if you can't figure out how to leverage um, right. their, you know, pull their levers and get them all pulling in the same direction, then, you know, you, you suck, you, you're not going to be effective. That is really interesting though, that as you get higher up in an organizational hierarchy, you need less and less. Well, would you actually, I feel like I'm sloppily phrasing that. Would you say the higher you get to an organization, you need less technical knowledge or acumen, or it matters less and less? Um, I would say you need less because what you need is supervisory capability. Okay. You need to at least understand the, the process and the workings of the black box well enough to look at somebody that's working the black box and say, this person's doing it right or this person's doing it wrong, which is a very different level of expertise than I'm going to go do it myself as effectively as the, the tool expert. Um, so artillery is a super easy um, way to illustrate that. There's You have a cannon crew and they have generally between seven and 10 Marines working on that cannon. Each one of them has a very specific job. Nobody has the exact same job as anybody else. And you have the one that does the, the traversing the cannon. You have one that elevates the cannon. You have one that you know, pulls the lanyard to fire the thing. And you are the officer standing there supervising them. Now you have a level of expertise that is sufficient for you to stand there and look at a gun crew and say, these guys are working well, and these guys are doing it safe. And you can look at another crew and say, these Marines are, are cutting corners and doing unsafe things. You have to be able to figure that out. But oh, okay. could I personally step in for any of them and make it a seamless transition because I'm the world's greatest gunner or ammunition technician or you know powder man or any of these particular jobs? No, I couldn't. I understand it well enough that I wouldn't. I'm not going to like cause a safety incident, but I'm going to be slow because I don't have the muscle memory that they have. Um, and I think that translates to business. If you were in a supervisory position over a bunch of software programmers, can you sit down and, and program software as quickly as they can? Absolutely not. But can do you know it well enough to supervise them? Can you look at, at reams of code and, and find some basic problems if something's going wrong? Do you know how to, how to identify issues? That's the kind of expertise you need, I think, for supervision. Yeah, it's funny because I struggled with that for a while and then I don't know how to code at all. <laughs> I know how to hire people. I know, I know, like I have contacts with data scientists who have master's degrees in mathematics that can work on consulting projects, and I can point them in the right direction. Um, that's that's interesting. Um, to that point, I think that early on in your career, you need to focus on like technical acumen. But um, what's going on, kind of in the like the subversively, is that you need to start understanding structures, so and, con and conceptual, and it starts to get more abstract. So like what, what is going on in the marketplace? I mean, specifically with you and like the artillery stuff, like this is the whole machinery and each person is siloed to one specific role, but you see yeah. how it all combines. 
So, but but also too, I think this also raises a point of right sizing your career your career path. Like if you enjoy the technical side, don't go into management. Yeah, there's a, there's a place for you always, um, because you know tool, tool specialists are valuable. Um, right, and especially in large organizations where there's a high specialization of labor, um, you know, Silvertone Analytics, you can't be an expert in one platform. You have to do ten different things. Um, but if you're at Google and you're good at Google's actually kind of a bad example. Um, if you're at Microsoft or Amazon and you're good at one thing, like if you're at Amazon and you're the world's fastest box packer and conveyor belt loader, you're always going to have a job and you're probably going to get piles of accolades for being the world's greatest at one technical thing, because that's such, such a core of what Amazon does. Right. Um, and, and speed and efficiency are the essence of their business. I don't think Google is special because it doesn't really have the same level of tool specialists. Maybe the, the programmers to a certain extent, but yeah, in retail, everybody does Windows. They're all doing their job and three side projects. So it's pretty impressive. Well, cause um, what I discovered pretty quickly on is that I am not a technician. I'm yeah. like an, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a business person, and I I, I kind of got into my entrepreneurship position through essentially becoming a data visualization specialist. But what I quickly realized is that it's it's the Red Queen theory. I don't, are you familiar with the Red Queen? I'm not. Um, it's I think it's actually from Alice in Wonderland, where it's like the Red Queen is is running as fast as she can just to stay put. So for, for me to be a content creator focusing specifically on data visualization, I would have to learn, I would have to constantly, it'd be pretty much a full-time job or at least a part-time job learning every new software update. Yeah. Um, every time there's a new product launch, learning that and then creating content. Um, where I want to kind of juxtapose this and kind of reframe it for the audience is that this means that you have job security. If you want to be a technician, and you are interested in learning about the new updates and you can totally geek out and just lose yourself in the technology, this is the right path for you because you can just continually learn. And I mean, as long as you're keeping up with the software, yeah, as, say, as long as the tool's still in, you, in use, you're good. Right. If you're, if you're a COBOL programmer, you, you're you going to have a job for a long, long time. That, that stuff's been around for what, like 30 years? So, right. But, but I mean, yeah, like, some of this more transitive stuff, you, you might want to be a bit more agile. Right. Well, but I mean, if you're the type of person who geeks out on technology, I don't think it's going to be a problem for you to learn. Let's say Power BI dies one day and Tableau takes over the market share. I, those are, I mean, I, I, I was telling you off air that um, when I was flown out to Santa Barbara to record um, LinkedIn courses, they were like, hey, by the way, we have a demand. This just came in. Uh, we need Power BI courses. I taught myself Power BI in like two days and created courses on it. <laughs> so I mean, it's doable. But um, all right, so we got a, we got some more comments from Iris. So uh, that was an excellent point that I myself learning recently as well. I'm trying to grow into a managerial role right now, and we've got even another thing from her. So one more thing I'd add about being a supervisor is also whether you've seen enough doomsday examples to call them out for the technical contributors to test their outputs against. Interesting. So I don't know if you've seen enough. I, th I think what she's talking about is just troubleshooting. If you've, okay. like how many things have you seen go wrong that you've worked through? And so the question earlier about quick labs and some, some troubleshooting thing that I don't think I've seen um, yeah, the longer you've been working and doing something and you understand how to work through a problem, a lot of times a kind of nose to the grindstone tool specialist is not going to know how to solve high level problems. That's what a supervisor is there for, to be the kind of calm, cool head and say, hey, the code's not working. Let's work the problem and figure out, let's troubleshoot it. Let's figure out what's going on. Um, correct. Hey, interpret it properly. Okay, so uh, Nikita Sharma's got another question. Um, so how do we approach this pr professional certificate to take the most advantage out? Specifically people from core tech wanting to transition into analytics. Interesting, so she's 
coming from the technology background wanting to pivot usually it's people who are not technical trying to go yeah. into the data space but tech into okay interesting what are your thoughts nikita i would just say the you know the five points that i uh illustrated at the first i think that all all of this course is valuable i haven't found a lesson yet where i just looked at it was like that's a throwaway it is all valuable stuff and it's all valuable to google which is you know in many ways the world's most successful tech organization um i would just say absorb it all study it all and if you're going from core tech into data analytics the most important thing is that you get that mindset and you know kind of the squishy skills like you don't you, you probably know how to code i don't know what your particular job is but you're probably a coding expert you probably can use tableau and if not you you probably can easily transition into those other kind of tech heavy skills but if you're a nose to the grindstone person and if you're you know one of these software programmers that like stares down at their shoes and you know can't can't carry on a conversation you need this these other kind of interpersonal skills you got to work on that stuff so do the assignment with the smart questions go go meet somebody you don't know yet and and say hey i got a homework assignment i got to ask you some smart questions can we do this you know let's have a coffee chat uh, meet someone new on linkedin and, and hit them up with with the questions um i think that's the biggest challenge for you is just get like we've just been talking about get from where you're firing the cannon as a software programmer to you're back behind the cannon and watching all of it and making sure it all works in support of the mission um, that's the analytical mindset versus the tool specialist. Kind of yeah. Uh, also too, I mean, it, it, this is really validating in that, I mean, that one of the assumptions we've had for the learning platform is that there is a lack of business acumen out in the data analytics world. Yeah. I think for you to be a good data analyst, you at least need to understand the context. So why are the KPIs important? What are the business outcomes that they're driving? What are the decisions that cause those that the data can actually inform? So yeah, I, I would start to study, maybe pick a lane. So like maybe you wanna do marketing analytics, start learning how marketing works as a whole. Yeah, I'd say Nikita, send me a message on LinkedIn. I'd love to know more about um, you know what your, your particular transition and what you're doing. Okay, so I, I can't ignore STR. So he's saying which, so Sean's saying, which tool should we focus on learning first? Cobalt. Basically. Cobalt, yeah, yeah. I was about to say, be a dinosaur immediately. Dinosaurs <laughs> are cool. <laughs> I don't know, STR is a little older than the average bear. Maybe maybe he's a Cobalt program. Um, yeah, I, so we're here talking about the Google Analytics course. Recently, I'm going back to name dropping. Recently, Alex straight up said the, the base skills you need are, and he spelled out exactly what's taught in this course. Uh, so he said, I'm trying to remember the order he presented them in. Um, I think he said Excel, SQL, uh, a, a BI slash Viz platform, and a base coding language, which he is a complete honk for Python, but he does at least in his in his more equitable moments he does at least allow hey look at r or python or maybe julia if you want to be like you know counterculture but um yeah th those four things i think and that's why you know part of the kind of magic of this course is this is this is a base building block for everybody it is a catch-all like go through this and at the very least at the end of it you're going to know what you don't know you're gonna have enough R to to sit there and say, okay, I know exactly where I can go for more instruction on this and, and what I need to do next. But right now I can use R to solve problems. Um, okay. For Tableau, same thing for SQL. Yeah, so you've had a lot of contact with um, STR. So do you, do you know any more context around like the direction he wants to head in? I don't, uh, we haven't talked a lot recently, so. Cause I, I would say, I feel like we should totally do like a. a I don't know if he's tossing us a softball question, like for the benefit of everyone else. Or uh, <laughs> well, because I would say, um, 
It depends on the lane that you want to pick because, for example, so I started out my consulting agency working with medium to small businesses. I didn't need to know SQL at all. I could go in and I could like, um, for example, I could just go into an ERP system, uh, hit a series of drop down menus and extract that data into Excel, format that, and then pull it into Tableau. And then that was, I mean, I think I've. The first one I had was like a three hundred fifty thousand dollar under optimization within a supply chain. So you don't need to have uh, impressive technical chops if you know the business acumen well. So I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a balancing act. I mean, ideally you'd want to have advanced, as super advanced technical acumen and super advanced business knowledge. But um, I mean, there's only so much time in the day for you to to really learn yeah, all this. To me, that's kind of the easiest way to spell it out. Obviously, you can do joins and queries in Excel now, um, you know, with Power Query. You can do joins and queries in Tableau with Tableau Prep. I think that SQL is necessary because it's like it scales to any size. So if you've got a, a database that's like the Silvertone Analytics database, or if you've got a database on like the National Health Service in England that is just like billions of whatever gigabytes, maybe not billions of gigabytes, but anyway, like the most massive database in the world, SQL treats them the same and the language works the same. It just depends like how powerful a, a, a machine you need to process them. But um, yeah, you can do SQL like stuff in other programs. They've all kind of incorporated that now. So you know, actually knowing SQL is if you're going to work with databases and most businesses have databases now that you've got to at least pull into other software to be able to deal with them. Okay. So we've got another person coming from, from non-tech. Sure. So that's, that's uh pretty normal. All right. Welcome from the non-tech world. So here is, okay. How much, so here's the last question that we've got um, so far. So if you guys want to continue the, the stream, Oh wait, already we got we got more. <laughs> uh, so Nishant asks, how much knowledge of math or statistics is needed in a data analytics at an entry level? So I, I grew up in Australia, so I have mad love for maths. <laughs> yeah, I totally really edited it. To yeah, yeah, that's it's... instinctively that's where my head goes. Maths. Um, how much knowledge of maths or statistics is needed in data analytics? I mean, I would say, honestly, if you're gonna work in tech, you should be able to do calculus and higher level algebra. I mean, it's just not, it's not a good field for people that don't understand some higher level maths. Um, basic stats is good, but I mean, when I did, did econ, there was calc in, in getting an econ bachelor's degree. There was algebra in getting an econ bachelor's degree. There's math in everything. So if you're going to be in this field, I would say, yeah. You, and, and there's ways to learn calculus is not um, not super weighty. Um, the, just the basic calc concepts are, are necessary. The stats. I mean, if you can do some, um, if you can do some basic distributions, if you can work with uh, linear regressions, confidence intervals. I think those, if you lack that, then at some level you're a button pusher um, and you're not, you're not the guy or gal that can stand behind the, the gun line and look around and understand what's going on. You're just kind of saying, oh, it all looks pretty. Um, yeah. You can do regression lines and confidence intervals in Tableau and have no freaking idea how they're calculated. But I would say you're never going to have an appreciation for what they actually mean. And you're also, you're not going to be able to troubleshoot. That's the thing. If you don't understand how it works inside the black box, you can't figure out when something's wrong or you have a limited ability to say this looks wrong. Um, so if you calculate, if you have a bunch of data points and you say, Tableau, show me the regression line and it gives you a linear regression. And you say, Tableau, show me the equation of the regression line and it shows you. And then you say, give me a 95% confidence interval in it puts your little curvy lines on there. If you don't understand where those come from at a basic level, you are behind. And if something's screwed up in that data and those things all look wrong, you're not really gonna understand why 
or, or you probably won't even be able to identify that they do look wrong and you're not going to be able to troubleshoot and figure out that, you know, you have a ton of outliers or you any data wrong or, you know, what okay, I'm going to push back on this a little bit and that uh, that's this harsh language that you're behind. You guys aren't behind. You're perfectly fine where you are. <laughs> In fact, you're on a journey and, and we're helping facilitate that journey. Um, I think it depends on the direction you want to go in. So like, I mean, honestly, I, I told this to like both of my classes at High Point University and Greensboro College. Um, I really just know how to aggregate data. And that, I mean, I, I know a little bit of math, but just being able to aggregate data, I have generated millions of dollars worth of value for my clients. Did you take calculus? Uh, yeah, I think I got like a C in calculus. So, I mean, like- Me too. <laughs> really good at it. I just didn't do my homework very often. Yeah. Um, and that's what I'm saying. There, there are people that, that could not pass calculus that their life depended on it. Those people should probably not become data analysts. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. We, one of the biggest lies we tell our children these days is you can you be anything you want. <laughs> Nothing can be further from the truth. It, it, right. it didn't matter what I did in my, in my life. I was never going to play center field for the Cleveland Indians, much as I wanted to. So, you know, we each have our own gifts and... You know, the, the the happy person is the person that learns to maximize their gifts and find something that makes them kind of fulfilled. There are people out there that should not be data analysts. Um, I think most data analysts will, will tell you that right off the bat. Yeah. Um, you know, if you just innately stink at math, I, I would say you're, you're always going to be incredibly limited effectiveness. Now, if you stink at math, you probably don't want to be a data analyst in the first thing, but I mean, it's... It's right. not like it's that great a job or it pays so much that, you know, that there isn't like a data analyst magazine with a, you know, dude smoking a cigar, you know, looking all handsome. Like, what, what is it? It's not, you know, we, we say data science is a sexy job and it's kind of tongue in cheek. It's just, you know, it's an attractive job because it's high paying and it's, it's trending upwards, I think still. But yeah, just if, if you're not good at math, and you haven't studied math, I would say you're always going to be behind the power curve. You're just not, you're not going to be able to understand what's going on at a basic level. Do you remember, okay, so Nikita Sharma asked, this is actually funny when I tried asking this question, let's say 10 to 10 analysts on LinkedIn, nine out of the, the 10 ignored it and didn't get enough information from the 10th person. Do you remember the question she, she asked? What was the question that she just is she talking about the smart questions for the assignment? Um, okay, so I think she was. How do we approach um, the professional professional certificate to take the most advantage? Uh, so going from tech into analytics. So uh, Nikita, I, I hope we answered this enough. I mean, we I feel like we talked about um, going from tech into analytics um, for like what five ten minutes. So I I, I hope. Um, f feel free to ask some more clarifying questions. Um, I think we're going to be on the, the, the chat a little bit longer. Al, do you have a hard stop anytime soon? I don't. No, I don't. Don't really. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would just tell her coming out of tech, you've got, you are the kind of T shaped expert. So I'm assuming you have one hard skill or, or two kind of related hard skills that you just have down cold. Capitalize on that, kind of fill out that that top bar of the T, get the, I would say, use this course, use some other MOOCs, kind of low cost, fill out your, your sort of mile wide, inch deep skill set that you can pivot from. Um, but, but you have a massive advantage, just like the person that is, you know, is amazing at math. Um, you have a massive advantage if you are an expert at math and stats, you are always going to have that bedrock of knowledge to fall back on. And then learning the tools is the simple part. Nikita, you, you've got some skills, I'm sure, that are that are hard to find and are very valuable. Build on that, fill in those those kind of small gaps and the you know the interpersonal stuff, problem solving, communication, whatever your your biggest weaknesses are, get those things, and you're gonna be a weapon. Yeah, and um, you may want to let me tell you a quick little story or anecdote about um, my Greensburg College student, Christina. So mm -hmm. Christina is a math major, and she's I guess just top of her class. I mean, I believe it. Yeah, she, I mean she's got like a three point nine nine GPA, basically a four zero. Um, and 
There's always that one professor that won't like. Yeah, give that it gave her an A. I guarantee the one B plus she got was like a tenth of a point, and the professor was like, "No, I'm, I'm not rounding up." Anyway. But, okay, so she oh, so she's coming from a very technical. I mean, like she had a th whole thesis that she had to present, defend mm -hmm. for her undergraduate. What was interesting is that I facilitated. So I, I was on the board of a nonprofit, and she she wanted some like real business experience. So I carved out a, a volunteer um, project where she got to um, do some some dashboard analysis for a nonprofit. So if you're in the tech space you may want to consider uh, finding some some volunteer opportunities. And if you're in tech, you probably know people who have, you know, businesses or you, you might be connected. Think about whatever community that you're in and then what are some of the smaller organizations? Because I'm sure there's, I mean, just about anywhere you go, actually, there's, there's probably some nonprofit that is trying to help out or yeah. you're at least adjacent to one. All right, so she's got, oh no, that's not her. <laughs> All right, I guess we didn't hear back from Nikita, but uh, Nishant said, thank you, sir, for guiding me. Uh, you and John are doing a great job. Also, can I connect with both of you on LinkedIn to communicate further? At us, yeah, for sure. So can I say something on that? Because okay. I, I get a ton, this is a personal thing. I know I've hit on this before, like when I was on the show. Like I get a ton of connection requests from people that just, I've never heard of them. I don't. You know, you've never engaged with me on LinkedIn and, and I'm in a position where I don't need like thousands more connections um, and kind of they just they just sort of muddy the waters. And I'm I'm a bit uncomfortable just just having like 10,000 connections, the vast majority of which I don't know, never interact with. They never speak to me. They never send me a message. Um, I would just say, Nishant and everyone else out there, you know, the five people that are still on the line, um, but just whoever watches this afterwards, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, and, and this goes for most people, especially in the data analysis world, just, just engage on something. Just like get on a post and talk and provide value. And then if you do that once or twice, I'll remember your name. And then if you ask for a connection, it's you know, immediate acceptance. If you send a message with your connection request, that goes miles towards me accepting. The ones that come in without a message that I've never heard your name, they just sit there for weeks because it's just there's only so many hours in the day. And you just, you know, if you're not if you're not talking to me and I don't recognize your name, you you've given me no reason to want to connect with you. You're just a person that clicked connect. Um, and there's no investment there. So Nishant, yeah, I've seen your name many, many times today. Awesome. You are you are a known commodity. Thanks for coming here and chatting with us. Absolutely. You send me a connection request, you, you're in there. Uh, I'm like I'm some prize like SDR. I'll always troll her. <laughs> and, and, and I have all these LinkedIn pens that like dip at me for all the stuff that, that I say, you know, when I'm griping about hundreds of like impersonal connection requests. Look, I am no prize. Being connected with me on LinkedIn is not like you've won the lottery or anything, but it's one thing that I can control and it's one kind of generation of noise in my life that I can say no on. Um, so yeah. I do say no. When when I get connection requests from people, it's like, you're not, you're not interested. You're not producing anything. I don't know you. Um, yeah, those are generally ignores. So if I know you, Jersey, Jersey you've been you've been no lurking, you, brother. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah, there. add us. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so we, we, Nikita's got even some more follow up. So she's saying, okay. "I worked as a robotics engineer. Wow, that's impressive. Programming languages, learning new skills, technology, software, anything is no big deal. Mathematics, statistics are easy. I just lack in business in a business degree." Hmm. Um. Well, okay, I'm assuming so, as an engineer, she has a bachelor's degree in engineering at a minimum. So, right. yeah, I would say a business degree is absolutely not a stumbling block for you. Um, yeah, be curious to look at w what the profile looks like and the resume. But, uh, yeah, hit, hit me up offline, Nikita. That's um, I, I can't, just based on that description, I can't think of a single reason why you would need a business degree. 
Yeah, um, well, I mean, it helps. But in, in fact, I would say a business degree would be superfluous. Like it, there would be too yeah. much. Like I would say, pick a direction, and I feel like I've echoed this. That I'm just repeating myself at this point. Yeah. So, for example, if you want to study marketing, study how, um, you know, machine learning or whatever technology. You, well, I guess you, you know, programming languages. So maybe study how the recommendation algorithm works or something. Um, like, I mean, actually, you could go back and watch some of our some of our lectures on here because we we talk quite a bit about business but I, I i keep getting like al this is awesome we, we keep getting so much like re um affirmation that we just need kind of like a business anal business 101 for analysts um but nikita i would pick a lane and then kind of just like for example if it's marketing study marketing 101 then you may want to go specifically into digital marketing and what you could do also is reach out to people who are in your state or in the space you want to be in and then just say, hey, what do you do? Hey, do you have any recommendations? Because um, it it doesn't have to be like you're learning in this vacuum. It can be yeah. very communal. And I think um, if you if you follow us, like what, what we're doing this summer is uh, we are building a learning platform that's going to be launched. I mean, it, it's interesting because we're like we're we're pre-selling and selling it as we launch it. But the end goal by the end of the summer, I don't think I've told kind of share this with everyone is that we are going to build a case study module, uh, uh, analytics 101 module, and then compare that with our guest lectures from last semester. And we're going to have a Greensboro College business analytics certificate program. Um, but what's cool and unique about what we're doing is that we're going to give you access to our data. So you can, I mean, if you follow actually this specific podcast series, as Al gets into the more technical stuff, we're going to pull up Google Analytics and he is going to apply what he learns. And um, we're going to see if we can kind of make it make sense. So like if what he's learning from a technical side, can we figure out, oh, well, we need a market on YouTube as opposed to Facebook. Yeah. So uh, what are your thoughts? I feel like I, I just went on. I, I'll get off my pedestal now. <laughs> no, I think. Um... First of all, I think Nikita, that is an awesome uh, YouTube profile picture, and you look like way too much fun to be a robotics engineer. That is not what I picture. <laughs> robotics engineers, I, I don't picture someone like that. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, Shruti, Shruti's here. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> hey, um, yeah agreed, one hundred percent. You do also, you're welcome agree. to join our community. I mean, look, look, you're already getting support from our audience, so. Um, so yeah, it's absolutely not a roadblock. I would just say, and you, sir, having an MBA, me having an analytics degree, not, not MBA type, but, um, I would just say if you're looking to add a degree, once you have the basic building blocks, which obviously you got an engineering degree, um, look for value. Like what's, what value is it going to provide? And that informs like, Hey, do you want a brick and mortar? school do you want like top flight because you know stuff like if you want the top schools like wake forest what, what are they charging now for for a year of school like 75 grand um so I mean, it's you're talking like six a six figure investment easy um to get to get degrees at some of these schools to get that premium name on there does that really matter to you maybe it does maybe it doesn't um you know there's certainly plenty of people going there Harvard's not hurting for students, but you need to figure out, it's like, how much value am I going to get out of this? Um, I looked into some, some non-res MBAs and some other like data science degrees that were, were far more manageable money-wise um, and probably available worldwide um, with, with semi-premium names on them. Like Georgia Tech was one, uh, was not terribly expensive. So um, look at that. And then just what's it going to provide for you? I would say you really need to go out there and, and survey, ask some smart questions, survey, get some coffee chats with some experts and say, look at my resume. Now think about what it would look like if I had an MBA. Is that is that worth $15,000, $50,000, $100,000, whatever you're going to pay for that thing? Um, it, does it provide that much value for you? What are you actually going to learn? The things that you learn. Are those providing value or are you are you going to some stodgy old school that 
is just high bound and, you know, they can't adapt. Because I'll tell you, there are schools out there that have a premium name that I wouldn't sign on for a data science degree from that school because you, you look at them and you look at the glacial pace at which they adapt. I, I won't name names, but out of respect for the, you know, the teachers that we have in our audience, but <laughs> no, none that, that you teach for Dr. Hall or anything. I'll just say, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Am I being called out on, live on air? There are schools out there that, that don't adapt. Um, and they no, were right. on a premium name to get by. Um, I like to think they're probably adapting now because a lot of schools are losing money because of, of COVID and decreased enrollment. But um, yeah, just, just decide, you know, make an analytical decision. So how much value are you going to get out of that degree and what's it going to cost you? And don't, uh, don't skip on the opportunity cost. This is going to take you a year to two years, depending on how, how you conduct it in person or online. Um, what else could you do in that time? Could you start a business? Could you could you knock out a stack of MOOCs or a, a nano degree or something that's going to give you more value that just isn't going to lend a premium name on that line on your resume? Uh, the, the, the options out there now are almost endless. Okay. Clarification. She is in India. You guys are, so she says, Nikita says, you're doing amazing work. There's not enough resources and openness about analytics in India. So I know India, from what my understanding, which I, we've interfaced with quite a few people who are in India, is a very different climate than it is in America. So um, I'm glad that we're, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we're having impact that you feel like you can you can learn from us and we're open. Cool. Yeah. And you hear, hear from a lot of people that are trying to get, uh, I think it's the H1 visa to come here as either as a student or as a uh, professional. And, um, you know, God bless you. Um, we can't. We've gotten questions on that before. We are not experts on H one visas at all, so right. don't don't embarrass us by trying to ask us questions on that. There are other people that can probably talk you on on that target, but um, yeah, very sympathetic. I know that in. I don't know if it's enabled that they can actually take the full Google course. I think they can because I've seen so many certificates from from Indian people that are not in the United States. But there are definitely countries where they can't. Uh, access this course, which sucks. Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right. So, Nikita, it looks like you've got a new friend. So, Shruti Jane says, for sure, we'll suggest. Everybody's friend. She's like the nicest person on earth. Okay. So, yeah, connect. You guys connect off air. Um, it sounds like she's got some people that she can uh, she can connect you to. Um, also, I think she had a question. Um. Uh, so she asks. Have you, has this changed your perspective about analytics or the way um, you think about analytics? Hmm. That is a really good question. Um, I think it just, it kind of reopens sort of closed corridors of your mind where a lot of the things, especially in the first two courses, it just illustrates like, hey, the, the teamwork aspect is important to analytics and the regarding the stakeholders and the, I think it does a fantastic job of that. I don't think there's any concept so far that has been totally new to me, um, whether it be a tech concept or a, a conceptual or domain concept. I think it's just reminders that, hey, this is important. Um, and then it's got the, the Google stamp of approval, like, Dealing with stakeholders is important to Google, so you should study it, um, if that makes sense. But changing my way of thinking, um, not, not really. I think I was pretty good on it. And this also helps me transitioning out of the military, too, because while you do have to regard your stakeholders in the military, it's a very limited scope. I mean, you've got whoever your commanding officer is, and there's an audience, and you got to be able to sell it to your, your subordinates. But... Um, yeah, it's, it's very restricted. The, the thing that's blown my mind at Google is how matrix everything is and how how wide of a communication pattern you have to have for, for anything that you're doing. Cool. Well, we have been rattling on for an hour and almost 45 minutes. Do you have any closing statements or arguments about the course? Um, I would just say that like the, the tech part, so I'm through I'm finishing up course number four, and I've seen many reviews of what's to come. The tech part is ramping up. 
Okay. Um, there, there is going to be more hard skills involved. There's more hard skills involved in the third course, which we will review next Wednesday at noon. Um, and we will advertise better, I swear. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the proportion of of squishy to to non squishy skills is going to to reverse slightly. It doesn't ever go full tech. Um, there, there are plenty of soft skills sprinkled throughout. Um, but it, it gets interesting very quickly um, if you're if you're sort of one of those ones that's pushing back on the soft skill heaviness of the first two. So the next one, it starts getting into SQL. It starts getting more into um, kind of combining spreadsheets and databases. Uh, and, and then that that just opens up the aperture for the, the follow on stuff with coding and visualizations and all that, all that good stuff. Awesome. Well, I'm a little bit hungry right now. So <laughs> too. thank you for doing this. And I thank everybody who tuned in and left comments and likes. And uh, if you guys share this, that'd be awesome too. Um, we will see you guys. Well, actually we're going to, we're going to be talking to her pre Friday. Friday. Yeah. yeah. Um, the arts of data science uh, Friday at noon Eastern time. So yeah. uh, hopefully I'll see you guys then. Bye.